Statement of Economic Managers on the Creation of the Maharlika Wealth Fund We, the Economic Managers of the Marcos Jr. Administration, strongly support the creation of the Maharlika Wealth Fund as a vehicle to move forward the agenda for prosperity and achieve the economic goals of the administration. The establishment of a sovereign wealth fund is a tried and tested investment vehicle that has been used by governments in both first world and developing countries to achieve their economic objectives. Most recently, the model of the Indonesia Investment Authority has been a successful model of a sovereign wealth fund that was used to fund the country's big-ticket infrastructure projects even amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. For Singapore, the investment gains from GIC, the central bank, and state investor Temasek Holdings PTE have been the biggest contributors to the national budget. Since 2018, without a doubt, the creation of the MWF will help us achieve our agenda for prosperity and the objectives for inclusive and sustainable economic growth we have outlined in our medium-term fiscal framework. Eight-point socioeconomic agenda and in the Philippine Development Plan 2023-2028. We thank our legislators for their hard work and openness in continuously improving the bill and for their continued support in the passage of our economic and fiscal reforms, including the amendments to several economic liberalization measures and our tax reform programs. We are likewise grateful to have a president who also recognizes the benefits of a sovereign wealth fund. These benefits include both direct and intergenerational benefits. Direct benefits of the MWF include increased investments in and funding of big-ticket infrastructure projects, high-return green and blue projects, and countryside development, including agriculture. Intergenerational benefits include increased access of future generations to income from investments such as potential earnings from extracted natural resources such as in mining. In the near and medium term, a sovereign wealth fund will enhance our fiscal space and reduce fiscal pressures as the fund pursue public infrastructure projects, as well as reduce uncertainties in cases when fund resources are channeled to high-yielding financial undertakings and assets that are underinvested in today's environment of high global inflation and the lingering effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have confidence that with professionals managing the funds, there will be efficient use and management of these investable public funds. They will be able to ensure the availability of an alternative high-return investment platform, obtain the best absolute return for the funds, find additional sources of liquidity as the need arises, and perform better risk management, given additional layers of checks and balances in the use of investable funds. Ultimately, this will redound to growth and help us achieve our economic transformation towards inclusivity and sustainability. Given all these, we urge the immediate enactment of the bill creating the Maharlika Investments. Corp. Let us not delay economic progress. Let us not deprive our people of this opportunity for prosperity. Signed Secretary Benjamin E. Diopno, Department of Finance Secretary Aimna F. Pangandaman. Department of Budget Secretary Arsenio M. Balisekin, National Economic and Development Authority Governor Felipe M. Medala, Banco Central in Pilipinas. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. President, uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and by the way, it is a, a saying in English that it is the prerogative of an intelligent mind to change their opinion. <laughs> so I think you are in good company. <laughs> I am honored to be part of this session at a time when the global economy faces, as attested to by the IMF, a tougher year than the one we just left behind. However, we in the Philippines welcome the, the, this year with guarded optimism as positive indicators point to a better than expected end of year economic performance on our end. Such performance was achieved even as our earnest efforts at recovering from the deleterious impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Our recovery has been made all the more challenging by the uncertainty that was induced by ongoing conflict, coupled with tensions amplified and magnified along economic and social equity fault lines in many parts of the world. We join other countries in bearing witness to the emergence of cracks and fissures of a scale that compromise the systems and institutions of global-wide economic interdependence. The interlinkages and integration represented by the complex array of supply and production chains have become the most ubiquitous feature of the modern global economy. Its efficient and effective functioning has not only contributed to a boom in global manufacturing and allied services, but has also played a role in the rapid prosperity of the country's position along such chains. New industries, companies, investments and jobs have been created. The incentive for innovation has become much more attractive. We grew together and poverty was reduced. But the confluence of forces that bore upon us the past years magnifies the differences and have shown the vulnerabilities in the underlying infrastructure that facilitate global supply chains. We have a perfect example here from uh, the, uh, uh, the, the comments of uh, PM De Croo, and he, uh, where he highlights the problem with the energy supply mm -hmm. of Europe, whereas perhaps in Asia, uh, the the problem manifested itself in food supply and food affordability. Whether natural or man-made, such disruptions and breakdowns have catastrophic implications for global business. So I am pleased to share with you that this government that I have been putting together has put forth policies and executed strategies intended to boost, to boost both robustness and resilience of often quite complex interconnected global supply and production chains. We do this by addressing our ability to keep the wheels of economy going amid severe disruption and our ability to bounce back from adversity. The Philippine economy will post growth of at least 7% for last year, the highest in ASEAN and one of the highest in the Asia-Pacific region, supported by macro, strong macroeconomic fundamentals and well, prudent fiscal policies. We have been making connectivity a priority, whether traditionally by land, sea and air, and now, of course, in the digital and meta realm. The Philippines recognizes the importance of mitigating the impact of climate change on economic growth and resilience. To this end, it is our top priority to design and build climate resilient infrastructure, programs and projects. We have allocated 9% of our national budget towards initiatives to support conservation, climate change, adaptation, and disaster risk reduction. I have committed to work to increase this figure to an average of 15% annually. Through our Build Better More flagship program, we have placed infrastructure development as the pinnacle of our vision for an equitable, prosperous, and resilient Philippines by 2040. We recognize the critical role of the private sector partners to enable the realization of these high goals. The recent amendments to our Build Operate Transfer Law address concerns regarding the financial viability and bankability of public-private partnerships and the concerns on potential delays that might impede implementation. We aim to raise the confidence of investors, especially those that will benefit the social sectors of health, education, and agriculture. Thank you. For this reason, we have taken a proactive approach. We have created a private sector advisory council, some members who are here with us, and we have formulated uh, many strategies so that we can uh, uh, position the Philippines properly for uh, the uh, development and evolution of the new global economy. Uh, that is a just a general overview <laughs> of uh, the effects as we have felt them in the Philippines. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon. It's, it's quite